thanks, Gerald, and we do appreciate uh, the opportunity to visit with you folks uh, tonight. Again, when Gerald called about this, I know one thing he told Kent and I both was, uh, number one, we wanted to make it very informal, uh, have an opportunity for questions, discussion, uh, try to try to make sure Donnie knows what we're what we're doing when we get done this evening. So, uh, again. This is an exciting area. I think it's a it's something that uh, is a unique uh, opportunity as we see uh, this technology rolled into the selection tools that uh, the beef cattle industry has available. And, and as Gerald said, uh, whether you're a seed stock producer uh, selecting genetics that are going to improve the breed or if you're in the commercial business and selecting bulls that you can uh, select with increased confidence and accuracy uh, I think it's a it's equally exciting for for the beef industry and how we can ultimately uh, produce a great product like we enjoyed this evening again when we think about selection we go back and and remember that I mean, originally all we have ever had uh, years ago to select from was just visual appraisal and trying to look at animals and, and try to predict their merit as a parent uh, and the kind of progeny that they were ultimately going to produce. At the American Angus Association, I mean, we've, since our inception about 128 years ago, have been concerned with maintaining ancestral records and so those records and understanding sire lines and cow families those things become very important as well but today uh, it's a little different business Eddie than maybe when we when we first start got started in the seed stock business and the information that's available the selection opportunities that we can that we can use to make improvement uh, genetic improvement is just unmatched today and so what we want to visit with you this evening a little bit about is some of the the things that we look at and talk about uh, today and even into the future again from the American Angus Association standpoint uh, Gerald mentioned the phenotypic data and what we've traditionally used as as performance measures and, and ultimately generating selection tools the American Angus Association, almost 17 million pedigrees in our in our database now, over 18 million performance measures, individual measures on different traits uh, that are economically relevant to the beef cattle industry. And so that's the kind of information that goes into the EPDs that we've grown accustomed to using. But we've seen a, a tremendous evolution of these kind of tools and that information uh, being used. Again, we talked about the association and how initially we were really concerned with maintaining pedigrees or ancestral information. About 50 years ago, the performance data, Angus Herd Improvement Records Program was started. There were some key producers right here in the state of Oklahoma that uh, were very, very instrumental in some of the early performance data collection uh, that the beef industry knew. And so we've used those different uh, stages and evolutions to, to get to the place where we are today. And so the new technology, when we think about DNA and genomics, is, is pretty exciting. But I guess we were going to step back and, and think about just EPDs in, in general, in, in basic, and again, making sure everybody's on the same page relative to just how EPDs work. So here we've got a little example, again, two bulls uh, with birth weight EPDs, the trait we're going to look at here. Again, bull A has an EPD of zero, bull B an EPD of plus five. So the, the way EPDs work is if I mate those two bulls to say 100 cows randomly each, uh, weigh all their calves uh, after they're born, uh, I'm expecting the calves out of bull A to weigh on average five pounds less than the calves out of bull B. Now the one challenge we get into with EPDs is it will not predict the actual performance of those calves. Uh, we can 
we can account for the genetic differences that may exist between those sires, but we still can't account for all the differences relative to the genetics within your cow herd, for example. The management or environment that those cows or heifers are running in that, that are producing those calves. And so that's the important thing to keep in mind. We can't predict actual performance levels, but we can predict genetic differences and how that's going to be expressed in phenotypic differences as well. This graph, real quick, um, again, let's pretend this is our bull A and bull B. Where we see or where we get this five pounds is gathering all of that data like we talked about. Now, each one of those calves is not going to be exactly five pounds heavier than the other one. You're still going to have those calves distributed over a normal shape bell curve, is what that would be called from a statistic standpoint. So you're going to have some calves that are out of the light birth weight bull that are still going to be out there above average of the group or of the heavier birth weight bull. Likewise, you'll get some lighter calves than average uh, out of the heavier birth weight bull. So, Again, we can't predict the actual performance, but we know that EPDs work extremely well to help us make genetic change within a population that's going to have a big impact. Now, the, the catalog you've got laying in front of you, uh, it's got a lot of information in it. Uh, and we know that these EPDs, again, we're confident in the ability to make genetic progress and selection improvement by using those EPDs. The basic uh, calculation of expected progeny differences uses kind of three components originally. We always did consider the ancestral information or the pedigree information when that animal had an individual performance measure, if it's a birth weight, a weaning weight, an ultrasound measure, that information on that individual performance data goes into calculating that EPD for a particular trait. And then when that animal becomes a parent, whether it's a sire or a, or a dam having calves, uh, the progeny performance data can also contribute to those EPDs. So when we talk about genomics or DNA information, I think it's helpful to understand how we're going to use that information. So the DNA is actually becoming another piece of information that goes into the EPD calculations. And so we're really just enhancing or improving the EPDs based on the genomic data also being included in those calculations. Now we've worked very closely with the Beef Improvement Federation and some of their direction has been that we really continue to use that language of the EPDs and the associated accuracies as we, as we disseminate this information that includes the genomic data as well. And we'll talk about, Kent will get into it a little bit more about the different pieces of information are available. But, but in general, if we concentrate on the EPDs and the accuracies, we know that that contains or, or involves all of the available information that we have on that animal in generating that prediction. Again, we've, we've enjoyed a great collaboration with Pfizer Animal Genetics as uh, the American Angus Association has become involved in, in providing this technology to our breeders and ultimately to the consumers of Angus Genetics. Uh, we've got kind of a a collaborative effort that we've worked in terms of how that information flows from the breeder, collecting samples like Express Ranches, providing samples on the bulls that are selling today. Those samples come through the association office, they go to the Pfizer lab where those, where those tests are run, the information comes back, we generate that data in our genetic evaluation that comes back and ends up in the catalogs or are available to you all uh, to make selections on. So again, here's a real quick example of the, some of the information that goes into the EPDs that we're using. It also helps us understand exactly how the genomic data is used. Again, 
We'll look at carcass EPDs, carcass traits. Originally, carcass EPDs were all based off of harvest data, so going into a packing plant, collecting ribeye measurements, carcass weights, marbling scores, fat thickness, those, that was the data that originally carcass EPDs were generated off of. About a dozen years ago, we started in earnest collecting ultrasound data on yearling bulls and females that were going to be used as breeding stock and using that ultrasound data as indicator trait data to predict the merit of individual animals and their ability to sire carcass genetics or carcass improved, improving genetics. So ultrasound data that we see on these bulls out here today was actually used as indicator trait data for carcass EPDs. And likewise, when we look at the DNA results, we're using the genomic data also as just another indicator of genetic merit for carcass EPDs. And so all of those pieces of information are combined and generated into EPDs. So in the Angus breed today, we'd have about 93,000 carcass records in our database. We've got nearly 1.3 million ultrasound animals uh, in our database. And now some, somewhere over 10,000 genomic results that go into these weekly generated carcass EPDs that, that ultimately produces values on about 2 million head of Angus cattle. So again, using all of that information in concert allows us to have much better predictions and, and predictions that you all can use with much more confidence in the industry. People ask, well, how accurate is this data, the genomic data? How accurate is it? How do I know if it works? Well, that's where we really, as the association, come into play because we're the ones that take the, the predictions that Pfizer and Dr. Anderson generate and we compare those predictions with our entire phenotypic database and we generate the correlations for these different traits which is which is indicative of how much impact the genomics will ultimately have on those EPDs and accuracies. So when we look at, a, at the carcass traits for example when we see the genetic correlations are between the genomic results and the actual carcass measures so it's when we're looking at uh, ribeye, it's measured ribeye in the packing plant correlated to the, the prediction from the Pfizer 50K results. And so it's a, it's a fairly high correlation. If it was a correlation of one, Dr. Edwards, that'd be perfect. It's not there, but it's still accounting for a pretty big chunk of the genetic variation that exists in that population. Again, Ken will cover some of that again in a little more detail, but uh, again, for most of these traits, uh, we're, we're accounting for somewhere in the 25 to 40 percent of the genetic variation within the population by using correlations kind of at these levels. Again, the information on these animals really goes into the EPDs then and is fairly seamless uh, when, we, when we look at that. But one way to tell whether an animal, if you're looking on our, our EPD pedigree lookup, has had this test run included in the EPDs, is right up here uh, under his name and birth date tattoo. So if you see a PF50 on, on an animal when you look him up, you know that that animal has had the Pfizer HD 50K uh, included in that genetic evaluation prediction. So what can the, this technology really do to us uh, and do for us? I think it is a few points uh, as we kind of wrap things up. And again, I think uh, without a doubt, we're able to provide improved selection tools that can really aid and speed along genetic progress. Uh, it allows us to, to have more confidence in those predictions. 
and especially on young animals. Again, Ken will get into a little more of the actual impact of using this technology on animals that are very low accuracy or have no progeny yet, but it allows us to make rapid selection with a lot more confidence and a lot less risk as we're using uh, younger animals in, in making breeding decisions. The use of the genomic data incorporated into our genetic evaluation on a weekly basis really gives you kind of the most current information, the most valuable information to be available. Uh, here in the last year, we have switched our entire evaluation over to having EPDs released on a weekly basis. So every Friday morning, we run that entire evaluation again and, and put it out on the web. And so those EPDs are updated using the new genomic data, any new phenotypic data that comes in, any new information uh, is updated on a weekly basis. Uh, up until this uh, year, we, the best that was ever done was about every six months. And so you, you really didn't have uh, the most current and valuable information uh, at your fingertips at all times. And then finally, I think uh, as we see this technology continue to evolve, uh, the, the technology is going to be used uh, extremely heavily in some, some areas that we don't know a lot about. We look at traits like feed efficiency, fertility and reproduction, maybe disease resistance. There's, there's a tremendous amount of research being done in those lines. And so the sky is really the limit at, at how this technology will ultimately Im, impact beef production as we go down the road. I think that's, uh, that was all I was going to touch on right now. I don't know if we want to turn it over to Kent and I can kind of get slides switched over or Gerald. Well, they, what we'll do, I'm sure Donnie has a lot of questions, but what we'll do is, uh, we're picking on Donnie today, but what we'll do is we'll go ahead and let Bill uh, switch out his slides and then we want to be sure that anybody uh, that has a question uh, can ask now or we can kind of hold those maybe till the end when Kent gets done because Kent might answer some of the questions that uh, you have out there. So next we'll turn over to Dr. Ken Anderson. Uh, he's with Pfizer's, uh, has been in the cattle business all of his life. Uh, we appreciate you being here. Uh, enjoy working with you and with that we'll turn it over to Ken. Thank you. Hey, thank you everyone for joining us this evening and um, on behalf of Pfizer Animal Genetics, um, special thanks to the whole crew at Express here, Gerald and the team. I'm going to do um, couple of things tonight. I'd like to try to introduce you to this new technology, but in the back of your mind, what I'm really making is a case for the fact that the animals that you're um, here to look at and bid on tomorrow contain more information than probably any animals you've ever had a chance to evaluate ever before in the history of mankind. And that's saying a lot. Um, there's a lot of data, uh, both in terms of pedigree and performance, but also genomics data that are feeding in to the predictions on this offering, which are going to make for the most dependable uh, purchase decisions possible. In the way of a roadmap, I'd like to cover off just a little bit on what are EPDs, to give you a little refresher if you forgot, uh, then introduce you to this concept of what are genomic EPDs, and then do some examples as to how that's going to equate to a better bull purchase decision for you as a commercial cow-calf producer. So just in the way of a, an example as to how EPDs work, I'm going to use weaning weight since many of us sell our calves at weaning. Let's say you have two bulls. One is plus 54 for weaning, the other is 40. There's 14 pounds difference in those two values. Incidentally, this bull would rank in the top 20% of the population. Bull B would rank in the bottom 20% of the population. So if we produce uh, a lot of calves out of a comparable set of cows from those two bulls, we'd expect the calves from sire A to weigh 14 pounds more at weaning time than the calves from sire B. Now you might ask, well, what does that amount to then in the terms of dollars and cents for me? Well, if that 14 pounds is worth a buck 45, and um, that uh, translates to $20 per calf, and that sire produces 100 calves in his lifetime, that's a couple of thousand bucks difference advantage to buying the bull with the bigger weaning number up here as opposed to the, to the bull down uh, on sire B. Now, 
One trait does not make a selection decision, but that's just an example of how EPDs work. And at the very simplest level, just remember, EPDs are just like the college football ranking polls. Uh, they rank animals from best to worst for any given trait based on all the information that's accumulated up to the most recent moment. And in the case of Angus, it's every week. And so you can have the best information all accumulated into that one number in the form of an EPD on a weekly basis. So where do EPDs come from? Uh, we'll get into that in just a minute, but I want to divert here just, to, just a second and uh, point out that in your catalog, there's a little write-up about this technology whereby you can go home and uh, review it. And I think sometimes to understand new technology, it's nice to do an analogy. And if you're in the corn business, this is a nice analogy. These are three generations of corn farmers. There'd be grandpa and dad and son. And here's what's happened in the corn uh, yield business over different periods of time as we've looked at um, yields and new technology. Hybrid seeds were produced back here in 1926, and they put us on track to have about a one bushel per year increase in yield as we farmed corn. Other tillage and fertilizing technologies came along, and we increased the rate at which we could increase bushels per uh, acre yield by um, a factor of 1.7 bushels per year. So then we're up to about 150 bushels through um, early parts of 2000. Now, though, they're using genomics technology to create trait stacks that are into corn, whereby corn is particularly resilient to things like drought, uh, suboptimal fertilizer rates, um, uh, challenges to insect and pest resistance. And um, now they predict that we're going to be somewhere between three and six bushels per acre increase per year in the corn yield, largely set in motion by the result of adapting genomics to plant breeding and corn production. So I'm just making a case here for the fact that this is happening all over agriculture. And um, fortunately for everyone here, the American Angus Association and Angus Genetics, Inc is integrating this technology for you in your um, seed stock genetic predictions. So let's um, talk a little bit about EPDs again. Historically, EPDs have been based on the pedigree information that Bill showed you, animals' individual performance, such as birth weights, weaning weights, and yearling weights, and how they performed in their groups. And then ultimately, what really drives accuracy is the progeny performance data. It's an indicator of genes the animals are actually inheriting from their parents. As commercial bull buyers up until now, you've purchased bulls based on information that indicates genes the animal has the opportunity to inherit from the pedigree, plus genes the animal actually possesses based on how well they performed in their groups. But now you have the opportunity to purchase bulls that also integrate 50,000 markers worth of information and how those markers are associated with actual inherited genetic merit that is then transmitted to progeny. So what we're doing is we're really jump-starting accuracy. Accuracy values range from zero to one. Low accuracy values in the 0.05 to 0.25 indicate that there are not progeny on board that are contributing to the EPD, whereas accuracies higher and closer to one indicate that there's lots of progeny performance information that has then got the EPD nailed down to being a very true predictor of merit. And what this technology does is it helps um, get us part of the way. It jump starts the accuracy and it jump starts the dependability of the EPD beyond what we've traditionally enjoyed. So it saves us some time, uh, some money, and some opportunity costs that are associated with selection mistakes. When we buy bulls that unfortunately don't turn out quite like we had, had, had planned. So it helps us avoid those mistakes. Now I recognize there's, um, there's some of you in the room that sure wouldn't buy a pickup without looking under the hood to see how it actually works. So I'm going to give you just a little, a little cowboy um, explanation, or try to, as to how this bovine SNP50 bead chip 
that generates 50,000 markers on each individual animal works. And, and here's what it looks like. This is an actual um, 50K chip. That's what you see on the left up there. So it's pretty small. It's about the size of a microscope slide. And um, what, it, what it is, is it was developed by the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center and a number of other collaborators throughout uh, North America and the world. But on this um, chip, there is the ability to test 12 animals. And each one of these wells represents a place where you can test animals. Now, each of these wells has microscopic beads on it that when exposed to an animal's DNA, some special chemical reactions happen. And through some fancy laboratory machinery, we are able to determine the genotype of the animal at 50,000 markers that are spread equal out across the scope of the animal's genome. Everybody get it? There'll be no quizzes, so relax. But it's fairly simple, though. All these beads are pre-programmed with chemistry. When they're exposed to an animal's DNA, we learn their genotype. We associate their genotypes, then, with differences in performance across all the production traits. Uh, we produce a genomic prediction, then, that uh, the folks at AGI, led by Bill and his team, then, integrate into the genomic-enhanced EPD. And, uh, that's about all I understand about it. So if there's any questions, we'll refer you to the scientists. So what's that mean relative to this particular bull offering and buying bulls that have genomic enhanced information? Bill pointed out the PF50 designation on the website. But what it really means is that those 50,000 markers that are associated with our production traits are all feeding into our EPDs just as the pedigree information is feeding in as well as all these weight and measure information. And uh, I have one more slide here just to show you how it works. Um, so this is the genomic prediction for Cavinese, in this case, Cavinese Direct. That information is feeding into the Cavinese Direct uh, prediction. As well, this actual birth weight and the birth information is feeding into the Cavinese Direct. And as you can see here, all these genomic predictions are feeding into the various corresponding EPDs. So I think one of the lessons for tonight as you consider the offering at hand is that as you're putting your selection decisions together, if there's an EPD that has the genomic information in there, it's really not necessary to also emphasize the genomic information because it's already integrated into the EPD. And that's really the beauty of the collaboration between Angus Genetics, Inc. and Pfizer Animal Genetics. Um, and that, that collaboration means that we're simplifying the technology for you all. If you're accustomed to using EPDs, you really don't have to understand much else other than knowing that all of the Pfizer 50K markers and the associations with performance are all being integrated into the EPDs and the accuracies. And I'll show you the effect that that is having on EPDs and accuracies here in just a minute. Now, there are a couple of traits that you'll see circled here. This is residual feed intake, and this is dry matter intake, and this is tenderness. And these are traits for which it is very difficult to produce EPDs because in the case of intake, animals have to be on a system whereby their daily dry matter intake is measured. And that's very expensive and time consuming and difficult to do on a wide, wide uh, swath of animals. So we can take our knowledge of genomics and we can get a genetic prediction for those traits whereby otherwise we would not be able to. The other thing I'd want to mention here is that as it relates to these predictions, particularly for these traits that aren't um, evaluated as EPDs yet, um, the values in the 0.05 to 0.25 indicate that there are not progeny on board that are contributing to the EPD whereas accuracies higher and closer to one indicate that there's lots of progeny performance information that has then got the EPD nailed down to being a very true predictor of merit. And what this technology does is it helps um, get us part of the way. It jump starts the accuracy and it jump starts the dependability of the EPD beyond what we've traditionally enjoyed. So it saves us some time, uh, some money, and some opportunity cost that are associated with selection mistakes. When we buy bulls that unfortunately don't turn out quite like we had, had, had planned. 
So it helps us avoid those mistakes. Now I recognize there's, um, there's some of you in the room that sure wouldn't buy a pickup without looking under the hood to see how it actually works. So I'm going to give you just a little, a little cowboy um, explanation, or try to, as to how this bovine SNP50 bead chip that generates 50,000 markers on each individual animal works. And, and here's what it looks like. This is an actual um, 50K chip. That's what you see on the left up there. So it's pretty small. It's about the size of a microscope slide. And um, what, it, what it is, is it was developed by the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center and a number of other collaborators throughout uh, North America and the world. But on this um, chip, there is the ability to test 12 animals. And each one of these wells represents a place where you can test animals. Now, each of these wells has microscopic beads on it that when exposed to an animal's DNA, some special chemical reactions happen. And through some fancy laboratory machinery, we are able to determine the genotype of the animal at 50,000 markers that are spread equal out across the scope of the animal's genome. Everybody get it? There'll be no quizzes, so relax. But it's fairly simple, though. All these beads are pre-programmed with chemistry. When they're exposed to an animal's DNA, we learn their genotype. We associate their genotypes then with differences in performance across all the production traits. Uh, we produce a genomic prediction then that uh, the folks at AGI, led by Bill and his team then, integrate into the genomic enhanced EPD. And uh, that's about all I understand about it. So if there's any questions, we'll refer you to the scientists. So what's that mean relative to this particular bull offering and buying bulls that have genomic enhanced information? Bill pointed out the PF50 designation on the website, but what it really means is that those 50,000 markers that are associated with our production traits are all feeding into our EPDs, just as the pedigree information is feeding in, as well as all these weight and measure information. And uh, I have one more slide here just to show you how it works. Um, so this is the genomic prediction for Cavinese, in this case, Cavinese Direct. That information is feeding into the Cavinese Direct uh, prediction. As well, this actual birth weight and the birth information is feeding into the Cavinese Direct. And as you can see here, all these genomic predictions are feeding into the various corresponding EPDs. So I think one of the lessons for tonight as you consider the offering at hand is that as you're putting your selection decisions together, if there's an EPD that has the genomic information in there, it's really not necessary to also emphasize the genomic information because it's already integrated into the EPD. And that's really the beauty of the collaboration between Angus Genetics Inc. and Pfizer Animal Genetics. Um, and that, that collaboration means that we're simplifying the technology for you all. If you're accustomed to using EPDs, you really don't have to understand much else other than knowing that all of the Pfizer 50K markers and the associations with performance are all being integrated into the EPDs and the accuracies. And I'll show you the effect that that is having on EPDs and accuracies here in just a minute. Now there are a couple of traits that you'll see circled here. This is residual feed intake, and this is dry matter intake, and this is tenderness. And these are traits for which it is very difficult to produce EPDs because in the case of intake, animals have to be on a system whereby their daily dry matter intake is measured. And that's very expensive and time consuming and difficult to do on a wide, wide uh, swath of animals. So we can take our knowledge of genomics and we can get a genetic prediction for those traits whereby otherwise we would not be able to. The other thing I'd want to mention here is that as it relates to these predictions, particularly for these traits that aren't um, evaluated as EPDs yet, um, the much else, other than knowing that all of the Pfizer 50K markers and the associations with performance are all being integrated into the EPDs and the accuracies. And I'll show you the effect that that is having on EPDs and accuracies here in just a minute. Now there are a couple of traits that you'll see circled here. This is residual feed intake and this is dry matter intake. 
and this is tenderness, and these are traits for which it is very difficult to produce EPDs because in the case of intake, animals have to be on a system whereby their daily dry matter intake is measured, and that's very expensive and time consuming and difficult to do on a wide, wide uh, swath of animals. So we can take our knowledge of genomics and we can get a genetic prediction for those traits whereby otherwise we would not be able to. The other thing I'd want to mention here is that as it relates to these predictions, particularly for these traits that aren't um, evaluated as EPDs yet, um, the question here is that as it relates to these predictions, particularly for these traits that aren't um, evaluated as EPDs yet, um, the EPDs yet, um, the